Okay? That's okay. All right. So I'm going to tell you about desugaring denotation into applicatives. Uh, I'd like to motivate this work by talking about Haxel. So Haxel is a Haskell library that we've built for doing parallel data fetching. We're using it pretty heavily at Facebook. It's used in a system called Sigma that we use for detecting abuse on Facebook. And if you saw Jeremy's talk earlier on, so Haxel is a similar kind of idea where we're trying to make data fetching parallel and batched where possible. So Haxel exploits applicative for parallelism. What do I mean by that? Well, let me give you an example. So my apologies if you've seen this example before. It's one I use very often. So this is uh, a function that computes the number of <laughs> computes the number of mutual friends between two Facebook users. So in order to compute the num number of mutual friends, I need to take two friends and their IDs. And this function takes two IDs and returns an int in the Haxel monad. And how does it work? Well, I'm going to need a function called friends of. So friends of takes a, a, a Facebook user and returns a list of friends of that user. So I can call friends of on x, friends of on y, and then binding the results to fx and fy, I can take the intersection of those two lists to get the number of, to get the mutual friends set, and then taking the length of that list gives me the number of mutual friends. Okay, and I've glued together my computations here using the applicative operations, in particular the applicative star operation, and Haxel's implementation of that operation gives you some parallelism. And when I execute this function, what happens is I get a parallel data fetch. So the friends of function is making a data fetch to some remote database, and because I have two friends of requests, they execute in parallel at the same time. Here's another way to write the same function. So I can write it using Haskell's do notation. And in the do notation, I just write a sequence of statements. So I've got two statements here, each computing friends of on x and y. And then finally, I take the intersection of those two lists and the length as before. So this version is somewhat clearer, perhaps, than the version on the previous slide. I didn't have to use any strange operators. I'm just writing a sequence of statements. And it's slightly less brittle, because I could just switch the order of these statements, and it would do the same thing. So perhaps you want to write this version instead. But what happens if I try and run it is that I get sequential data fetches instead of parallel ones. That's not so good. Why does that happen? Well. Let's look at the applicative operator, the applicative star operator. So it takes two arguments. The first argument is a computation that returns a function from A to B. And the second argument is a computation that returns an A. And then once we've got the function from A to B and the A, we can apply the function to the argument and get the result B. So the point is that these two arguments that we pass to this operator are independent computations. They don't depend on each other. So the implementation of this operator in whatever applicative you're using can exploit parallelism if it wants to. And that's exactly what Haxel does. In contrast, the monad bind operator, which is how you combine computations in monads, has an explicit dependency between the computation on the left, which returns an A, and this A gets sent into the computation on the right, which is a function from A to MB. So whatever you do, if you're using a monad, you can't exploit parallelism in the bind operator. So back in the original expression here, when we used applicative, the fact that friends of X and friends of Y are independent means that we can use applicative and get parallelism. So in order to exploit parallelism here, the Haxel programmer is going to have to figure out where they can use the applicative operator. And, OK, we're all experienced Haskell programmers. We can probably do that on examples like this. But it can get pretty difficult. So here's another example. In this example, we've got a sequence of statements. And there are some dependencies between them. So for example, 
when we apply B on the second line, B is applied to X1. X1 comes from the first line. On the fourth line here, I've got X3 coming from the third line. And finally, I've got a dependency on the first line and the fourth line. So it turns out that the best way to translate this into applicatives looks something like this. Now, if the programmer has to do this on a regular basis, their head is going to explode. So that's not great. And maybe you think that, well, I'm an expert Haskell programmer. You've just written this in a horrible way. That's, that's fairly true, actually. You could refactor it. <laughs> you could refactor it in, an, in a nicer, nicer way. But there's no way to get away from the fact that you have to somehow turn this sequential list of statements into a tree, a tree of applicatives that reflects the structure of parallelism that you want. So should the programmer have to use the applicative star operator explicitly? And we're going to argue that not always. They shouldn't have to do this. It's hard to get right, as we just saw. It obscures the functionality. So if what you care about is the functionality of your code, first and foremost, then the difference between applicative and monad is just noise that's getting in the way of somebody reading about what your code really does. Furthermore, it's harder to refactor code later. So when you refactor code, what tends to happen is that you introduce dependencies or you remove dependencies, and that has an effect on the structure of the applicatives that you could use. And finally, particularly in our situation, it's difficult to, to have to teach the applicative operators as well as the do notation. So what are we going to do instead? Well, we'll let the user write do, not do notation only, and we'll have the compiler translate to applicatives where possible. And there's a nice side effect of doing this. What we're going to get is the use of do notation for types that are applicative but not monad. And because applicative is a weaker abstraction, there are more types that are applicative than there are monad. So let's see how this works. Well, starting with how we translate do notation in Haskell as it is, we start with a sequence of statements. And every time we use a bind, the left-hand arrow, we turn that into the monad bind operator. So that's straightforward. That's all that happens in Haskell right now. In order to turn this into an applicative, what we have to do is the right-hand sides of each of the statements become the arguments of the applicative expression. And then finally, we need to bind the variables that we got from the left-hand sides of the expressions here, of the statements, sorry. And the expression that was being returned goes on the left-hand side of the applicative expression. So that works fine when there are no dependencies between the statements. But what happens if we have a dependency, and here I've used the syntax to indicate that B has a dependency on the result of A. In this case, we can't use applicative star. So what we have to do is fall back to the ordinary monad desugaring and use bind instead. So let's look at a slightly more complicated example. So in this example, I've got a pair of statements A and B that don't depend on each other. And then I've got a pair of statements C and D that depend on the results of A and B, respectively. And I'm going to use this syntax down here to indicate the structure of parallelism that we can expect. So this says that I can do A and B in, in parallel followed by, so the semicolon means sequentially, followed by C and D in parallel. So this is just a more concise way of expressing the structure. OK. How do I translate this? Well, first of all, I'm going to have to do A and B in parallel. So that's the first applicative expression. And now I need the result of that. So I've made a pair of the results of A and B here. And here I'm doing a bind, matching on that pair that we made in the first line. And then finally, I can do C and D in parallel and make a pair of the results. OK, let's look at the dependency graph of what we've done here. So here's the graph. We've got A and B in parallel. We made a pair of the results. Then we did C and D in parallel and made a pair of those results. But there's something a bit strange going on here. 
So what's this node in the middle where we made a pair? It seems a bit strange because it doesn't appear anywhere in the original do expression. In fact, the only dependencies we had were a dependency from C on A and D on B. So maybe what we should do is use this graph instead. So in this graph, we've got dependencies on from A to C and B to D. And here's the syntax that corresponds to that. Now we're doing A then C in parallel with B then D. And maybe this is a good idea because if A and D were large things, we could actually overlap them now, now that we're not doing a synchronization after A and B. So we actually get more parallelism this way. And if we translate it into the applicative syntax, we end up with something like this. But there's a problem here. Imagine if you're using not Haxel, but say the state monad, for example. Now this expression on the right is not the same as the expression on the left because when you flatten it out, the effects happen in the order A, C, B, D, instead of A, B, C, D. So we made a translation that's not semantically equivalent to the original. So there's a design decision here. We can either reorder statements or not. And reordering exposes more parallelism, but it's only valid if the monad is commutative. And without reordering, it's valid for all law-abiding monads. By law-abiding, I mean the laws that apply to applicatives and monads. So in our case, we chose not to allow reordering. And part of the motivation for that was that Haxel is not commutative, because we have exceptions. And it also means that we can just apply our transformation to all the existing Haskell code. Uh, and provided it satisfies the laws, it won't break anything. But going back to this example, we can do something a little bit better than what we had. So there's this pair in the middle here. And we'd like not to have to build this extra pair. So in order to do that, we're going to have to move this expression, the C and D in parallel, into the left-hand side of the first applicative expression. But if we move that inside, what happens is we've now got a nested computation, a computation that returns another computation. In order to flatten that nesting out, we're going to need to use the join operator. So join takes an M of M of A and flattens out those computations. So our algorithm works in two phases. First of all, we do something called rearrangement. So rearrangement groups the statements into parallel blocks. And we're going to use the vertical bar as a way to indicate the boundary between blocks. And finally, we'll do desugaring. So desugaring is a purely mechanical uh, process that takes the rearranged expression and turns it back into Haskell syntax using applicatives and monads. So here's an example of rearrangement. Let's take this sequence here. So we have A and then B that depends on A and C that doesn't depend on anything. So we drop the return statement, first of all, and we split the sequence at points where there are no crossing dependencies. So where there are no dependencies on a statement below the line, on a statement above the line. And this red line here indicates where we can split the sequence here. And now the two blocks, the, the ones that are on either side of the line, uh, become separate blocks in our composition separated by vertical bars here. If there are no split points, what do we do? Well, here's an example where we have a statement A, and then B and C both depend on the result of A. So there's nowhere that has no dependencies crossing here. So we have to find somewhere that we can insert a semicolon. OK, let's suppose we insert the semicolon after A. So we have a block containing just A. And then, if we recursively rearrange the other block, we find that we can do B and C in parallel. So rearrangement propagates recursively down the tree. But how did we know where to, where to insert semicolon? Well, we could just try all the possibilities and see what happens, find the best one. But we have to know what the best one is somehow. So what do we mean by best? Well. We're trying to maximize parallelism. So let's just use a simple parallel cost model where 
we use maximum when we have parallel, and we just use sum when we've got sequential. And since we don't know anything about an individual statement, we'll just say all statements have the same cost, one. All right. Uh, so then we get to desugaring. And desugaring takes these, the parallel blocks, turns the parallel block into an applicative, as you might expect. And here's where the return comes back. So the return goes in the left-hand side of the applicative. And finally, we recursively desugar things. When we have a semicolon, that turns into bind. And that's it. You can find the details of this in the paper. So what about optimality and efficiency? Well, we prove that our algorithm respects the optimality of the simple cost model. And implementing this algorithm is n cubed if you use dynamic programming. Although in practice, what we found is that it's much faster than that. So if you have applicative only, a type that's applicative only, then you can use the do syntax as long as you have no dependencies between the statements. When there are no dependencies between the statements, we can guarantee to produce an applicative expression. And then the type of this will only have an applicative constraint. It won't have a monad constraint. So there's a very simple rule that says when you can use the do notation with an applicative, it's just there are no dependencies between the statements. So we did an implementation of this. It's in GHC 801. Uh, it's optional because you have to say to GHC that I don't mind you exploiting the laws uh, because you know, nothing else is forcing you to, uh, to write applicatives that satisfy the laws. So it's an optional feature. And we use an, a, a heuristic algorithm by default. So our heuristic algorithm is n squared. But optionally, you can request the optimal algorithm if you want to. And our heuristic algorithm was optimal in 98% of cases. That's 98% of do expressions gave the same answer in both cases. Maybe you're wondering how often it applies. Well, we tried it on lots of code. We found 1,000 odd packages in uh, Stackage, which had 38,000 do expressions in there. And 42% of them had some, some instance of parallelism, right? somewhere that we could use the applicative operation. And in fact, 28% of them didn't require monad at all. So we could have used a weaker type, uh, an applicative constraint on those. We also looked at the Haxel code base at Facebook, which also has a lot of do expressions. And interestingly, we found a similar proportion of those do expressions that didn't require monad at all. But where there was a difference was in the number of do expressions that were translated using at least one uh, applicative star. So uh, I think in the Haxel case, what we've got is a lot of smaller do expressions that only require fmap, only require functor. They don't require applicative as well. So I've got some results here. So we tried three different request types on our uh, Sigma implementation. And so each of these request types is doing something slightly different. So they have different latency characteristics. And request three, which had a very low latency, saw some improvement when we turned on applicative do. And these longer requests, the requests that took a longer amount of time, saw a bigger improvement. But the improvement was quite dramatic. So we went down from 150 milliseconds down to about 90. So in conclusion, you can see more examples in the paper. There's one interesting question that comes up, uh, which people often raise when I describe this. Uh, so applicative do is really two things. We've got some kind of syntactic sugar, which applies to applicatives. But we've also, also got this interesting analysis that's trying to do something that looks like optimization uh, on things that are applicative and monad. So it's, it's both a compiler optimization and a syntactic sugar. And we're using the same syntax for both of those things. So there's a discussion to be had about whether they should be using the same syntax. And that's all I have. Thank you. <laughs>
Thanks, Simon. Any questions? Thanks, Simon. Um, you said uh, the heuristic algorithm, sorry, I'm here. Uh, it, you said the heuristic algorithm uh, is successful in 98% of the cases. I'd be interested to know what those 2% look like. Uh, well, you saw one example near the start of the talk, actually. So that, that complicated example was one case where a heuristic algorithm doesn't find the optimal solution. Um, there are many different heuristics that you could choose. We chose one particular one. The one that we chose biases towards parallelism at the beginning of the block. And you can easily defeat it if you know that's what it's doing. Um, so, yeah. so that's very cool stuff. This is more of a, a comment than a question. So one of the things about applicatives is they satisfy these eight laws. Um, well, we used to think there were nine, but it turns out one of them you don't need. Um, and if I stuck on Desert Island, I couldn't remember all of them. Uh, but it turns out that if you rewrite applicatives using um, comprehension style, that then they just satisfy five laws from which you can derive the eight. And the five are ones I can remember. They're the monad laws and beta and eta for um, star, uh, which gets a slightly different notation when we do it. So there are other reasons for wanting to use the do notation besides the ones that you give, right? which is you get easier reasoning out of it. Um, and we never worked out the smooth moving between our notation and monads. It, it occurs to me, we, we have a different star, so I'm not sure if um, either of our subsumes the other. We, we should check that. But there should be some way of smoothly moving between the two, and one of the advantages you should get is an easier way to write down the applicative laws. Right, right. Oh, that. yes, so I am. You're right, I'm thinking of arrows rather than applicative, so. Aha, right, good point. Does that render the entire intervention moot? <laughs> <laughs> Possibly, but we should but I could, check I could about sending it to error. <laughs> ah. uh, so since you mentioned uh, comprehensions, I, um, uh, I should mention one thing which is nice about comprehensions is that they enforce the return at the end. Okay, so you don't have to write return explicitly, whereas in do notation you do write the return. And one, you know, slightly... Uh, unpleasant thing about our translation is that it has to recognize return in, in the final position, which is not the case for a comprehension. Hi, Jeremy Gibbons from Oxford. Very nice, uh, uh, as, you, as I know. Um, th this cost optimization you do, you, you, you just take the very simple assumption that everything costs one, every basic thing costs one. Right. Um, and, uh, so, and I think the, one of the examples you had with the A, B, C, and D um, another strategy is to have run the B and C in parallel and actually have three blocks. Uh, and, but if they all cost one, that's worse. But if you happen to know that B and C both are expensive, and you, it's yes. good to run them in parallel. Yes. Um, now, of course, you can't work this out. But if perhaps, perhaps as a programmer, I'd like to be able to give some hints to say that, that the costs, I, I expect these things to be expensive. So can you please try running them in parallel? Could you do that? Could you? Would, um, you could certainly do that. Uh, something that's, that's related, it's not quite the same thing, but we have thought about is uh, the programmer could do the rearrangement step themselves. So one reason that you may not want to write applicatives directly is that you have to do a lot of plumbing. Sometimes you have to tuple things up and pass them around. Um, but if you, could write, if you could write down your do expression in the rearranged syntax with parallel blocks, then the compiler's doing the plumbing for you. I don't want to have to do the rearrangement. I don't want to write the nice comprehension yes. and let you do the rearrangement <laughs> for me. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, uh, it's a good idea. Yeah. One more quick question. Yeah, so, so I guess I originally had a follow-up question to Jeremy, which is if, if you ever find yourself rearranging things, uh, if, you're, if the assumption of your cost model are not correct, to then make the algorithm produce the output that you want. But, but I'm just going to state that question. And, and, but if Sharp's answer to that problem is to have, like, friends of have a different type, right, which is Haxel of Haxel of int, and make the parallelism explicit, uh, 
uh, wouldn't that be a much easier way to do that problem? I'm, I'm not familiar with F-sharp. So, so essentially, you, you have a fork operation, right? And oh, so, right, right, right. right? So, um, yeah, so uh, I think you're asking about whether you could do it in a futures style. Yeah. Yeah. So what are the advantages of that over a future style formulation? Uh, so there's less opportunity to go wrong in this style. Okay. Because in the future style, you, you get to wait for your future too early and lose parallelism. Well, but the waiting is explicit, right? Yes, so yes. But, uh, and, and you don't want the waiting to be explicit because you can wait at the wrong place. Ah, OK. That actually happens. So yeah, I don't have I a guess, great deal I guess of experience does, but, but of, of, of F-sharp, but yeah, I think... It never seemed particularly difficult to me. OK, thanks. Yeah. Let's thank Simon again.